sailors or people working at sea, what's the most creepy or most amazing sight you witnessed? Like and subscribe or I'll haunt you tonight. Often times in the Navy, I'd stand on the fantail and watch the ocean. Once we had 100s, probably around 400 dolphins riding the carrier's wake. They followed us for three days. In the middle of the Pacific, it's so dark and there's so little light pollution, you can see reds, browns and faint blues of gas clouds in the stars cape. Another time, I was watching the water at night, they say it draws you in, and it really does. You look at this pitch black void, with only the wake or turbulence of the water catching light, and intrusive thoughts of jumping and just naturally occur. It's mesmerizing, especially if you're alone. At night during one of these events, I saw blue glowing water, what I now know was bioluminescent algae, and inside this rather massive patch of blue glowing water were squid, that appeared to be maybe 15 to 20 foot long. You could catch their outline by the light from the water. I stared at what was multiple squid passing by for minutes, what seemed like an eternity and then the light started going away in the spot I was staring. There was still a lot of glowing water, we weren't headed out of it. But this patch gets darker and darker and darker until pitch black. A solid 15 seconds of intense curiosity. Suddenly, a lot of turbulence and a whale surfaces. It had snatched up all the squid. The whale cocked to one side and looked at the ship, and our eyes met I wanna think. It studied the ship for a moment until just sinking back down until the glow of the water masked it completely. Fresh out of college, I got a job in Cambridge, Massachusetts or so they said, as an architect designing whatever. Ended up doing oil rigs and one beautiful morning there were sharks going under the main platform like always, but there were two dead sharks. Next morning three new dead, then four the next day. Then a steady four or five a day for a week or two they would float up under the sea through deck that looked much like a metal colander. Crew would have to punch them down, so the current could catch them with a large pole. What made it really weird was they looked like they had heart attacks or died in their sleep, no marks or bites or anything. The guys on the rig had all kinds of theories. Then one morning while in a room that was completely submerged and had a beautiful view as we sat in a meeting, everyone got to see the reason the sharks were dying like viewing it on a movie screen. This octopus had made itself a home between the base and the deck. A shark was swimming by in a cruising fashion and we see these tentacles grab it right in front of the glass and snap it like a glow stick. The marine biologist smiled and said, octopus is literally doing that to entertain themselves, like because he can. The marine biologist lowered a dive camera and this octopus was huge. The crew would joke about it thereafter, people would smoke on the deck at night and people would say don't let the octopus in. Seeing those tentacles was just insane for their length, and to think about how a shark is mostly muscle and the octopus would just snap them was kinda scary. Giant spears plunging in and out of the sea. In the Gulf of Alaska, I have seen some stuff. But one of the most terror-inspiring things I've seen are what can happen with some of the loose logs from the logging trade. Sometimes when a big log gets loose from a raft, it becomes partially waterlogged and floats small end up. So you have this 4 foot diameter telephone pole in the sea, sticking up 40 feet into the air. No biggie, shows up on radar, and easy to spot. Now, give that pole 20 years of floating around or so. It rots in such a way that it becomes sharpened to a perfect point by wind and waves, and looks quite menacing. Now, put it in a gale with 25 foot waves, 50 feet trough to peak. And it becomes a towering spike of death that shoots up from the sea every 15 to 20 minutes out of nowhere, 60 feet into the air. Only to plunge down into the dark depths waiting to skewer some unsuspecting boat in a few minutes when it thrusts out of the ocean again. It is a genuinely terrifying sight, rare, but not so rare that I haven't seen two in one season. It's like the spike duck of Neptune looking for an opportunity to beat you up in a particularly terrifying way. I was engineer and first mate on a converted LCM-80 in the fish trade. We operated in the Gulf of Alaska, Prince William Sound, and Bristol Bay Fisheries as a tender, taking salmon and herring from smaller boats and villages in for processing on land. We had a regular spool windlass on the back, and for some reason, the company thought this made us equipped to tow a 220-foot barge from Whittier, up through the Aleutian Islands at False Pass, and around to Bristol Bay and back each year. The Gulf of Alaska can be a cruel place sometimes, and at 4 knots max speed towing the barge, we got caught in a doozy. 
We tried sheltering behind an island, can't remember, we were working our way up the Aleutian Peninsula, but even so were unable to hold against the wind and got pulled out. The little windlass on the back deck was getting pulled off and ripping a hole in the engine room in the process. Eventually, in 25-foot seas, we let go the barge and just tracked it and followed it on radar, figuring we'd recover it when things calmed down in a few days. In the horrific days that followed, during which I must have vomited twice my body weight, we nearly got rolled once and took on about 10,000 gallons of water in one of our compartments. So, good times. On the last really bad night, I was on watch in the wheelhouse while the captain slept. About 3 a.m., and we were rolling 33 to 37 degrees, losing two knots against the gale by the Lauren, yes, it was a while ago, with the barge popping in and out on radar about four miles in our lee. Suddenly, the whole ship reverberated and shook with a thunderous boom, and I was sure we were done. We'd obviously hit something hard. I woke the captain and the deckhand 15 minutes later, still no sign of flooding in any compartments or other alarms. But I noticed the Lauren lost signal, and I wasn't having any luck on the SSB trying to call in for a possible rescue. The deck lights wouldn't come on, and we had a couple of pop breakers in the navy lights. After a while, it became obvious we weren't sinking, so we went about our watches just keeping an eye on things. At first light, I roped off and went on deck to see what the heck, and then I saw what had happened. The World War II surplus LCM-80, Vietnam-era LCM-8, sorry, I misremembered that, had a deck house at bulwark level, and a pilot house and stateroom built above that. So the roof of the pilot house was a good 25 feet above the water. Mounted to the steel of the pilot house was a 4-inch steel pipe that went up a few feet to a 3-inch steel cross member. Forming a large T on which our radio and navigation antennas, as well as our mass lights, were mounted. It was gone, the whole thing. Bent over at 90 degrees and broken off as if by the hand of God himself. Also gone were the life rafts, which were also mounted on the roof structure. The massive 4-inch steel mast had been bent over and torn off. It wasn't like it was corroded and just broke. There was obviously massive force involved, and even the reinforced steel plate of the mast step on the cabin roof was distorted. It took us about a week, but eventually, the seas abated and we were able to bring the barge in under tow to the shelter of the peninsula once again. We made the next thousand miles without much except flat seas and beautiful vistas, such as the life of the mariner. When we eventually got into Dillingham, everyone was quite surprised as we had been declared lost at sea and the Coast Guard had already given up the search days before. Both our life rafts had been found empty with their emergency position indicating radio beacon deployed, and we were all assumed dead. I still have no idea what monstrous thing must have reached out of the sea and broken off that mast, but whatever it was was inches away from taking out the wheelhouse where I was blindly staring out into the rain-tortured darkness on that night. Still haunts me. In the USCG, was in the Eastern Pacific in February 2017. The bioluminescence at night was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Sailing the Caribbean you get the glittering speckles in your wake, but in this water the stern wake glowed very bright. Almost made it pointless to be running darkened ship. The bioluminescence was so much so that even fish in the water activated it. I remember a ghostly glowing cloud silently move in toward us where we were taking it all in on the fantail. Then just as silently it moved away. We could see larger glowing clouds, likely a school of fish, then a glowing streak, maybe tuna or something come flying into the glowing mass and the school would explode like fireworks underwater. Saw this occur a few times, it was amazing. Another time we were in the Caribbean, middle of the night at flight quarters. I was on the fire party and we were staged on the fossil. We were kind of bored waiting for the helicopter come back. All of a sudden, this massive meteor hurdles by overhead completely turning night into day for a second, we were all in disbelief. The people wearing NVGs were a little tick though. Was standing topside watch on a dark night when the sky suddenly turned bright. For about 3 seconds, something was incoming that lit all the weather decks up like daylight. This sparked quite a reaction on the bridge and in operations. We were forward deployed during wartime although not in a region where active fighting was expected. For a moment people scrambled, fearing we had been targeted for a surprise missile attack. Then the sky went dark again just as suddenly as it had began, leaving us safe and alone again. Yet there was still a whole bunch of commotion on comms as people jabbered stuff that amounted to whiskey tango foxtrot. The only crew member who saw what had really happened was me. It's a meteor, it's a meteor, it's a meteor. 
had to repeat the report several times before anyone paid attention. A meteor had come down almost directly above us, then broken up into three pieces as it burned up in the atmosphere. It was like a fireball. That put on quite a light show into the ocean on a moonless night at oh dark 30 in the middle of nowhere. Astronomers call these bolides. It might even have been a super bolide, but it isn't on the list of recorded super bolides. We may have been the only ship that saw it. Based on the time of year and the location it may have been one of the southern Taurids, a meteor shower that's noted for producing fireballs. Not a whole lot of people ever witness a meteor that's spectacular. By lucky coincidence, I got a good view of this one. I used to work on an Atlantic salmon farm a few miles out to sea, best job I ever had. We were round at the second site. Other side of the island to the main site, and this one was being left fallow for a couple years, so just required some maintenance every now and then, was used for storage. Me and my brother were there late afternoon to check some ropes or moorings or something, I can't remember. When all of a sudden, there was this really strong electrical or copper smell and the place went silent. It was flat calm, relatively clear skies, so it wasn't a thunderstorm coming in. For some reason, this smell really freaked us both out, and we both felt like we were being watched by something and there was a kind of strange feeling or atmosphere to the place where it just seemed off. After a couple minutes, it went away and the atmosphere returned to normal. We were pretty glad to get back to the main site, but never experienced anything like that again, really weird. This one is hard to describe, but sometimes we would have to pull super long 18 to 20 hour shifts at harvest time. This involved starting sometimes at 2 AM and working until late in the evening. There wasn't actually loads of work the whole time, to do we just needed to be present for a lot of it and lift a cage net once an hour or so. So we mostly just stood around drinking coffee and talking bollocks. Anyway I digress, we were starting out one of these mornings in the speedboat heading out to the site, on a really crisp winter night. Not a breath of wind, super cloudless sky and a hint of aurora above us. Speeding along into the night with my buddies in this beautiful scenery, nice fancy survival suits on to keep warm, I remember looking up and seeing a huge sky full of stars, and a shooting star burning across the sky out towards the horizon. As I say I can't really bring it to words, but I've never really felt more alive or happy in my work than that night. Creepiest would be underway on 31st October or Halloween day off maybe 15 miles off the coast of Florida near Miami. Lookout sights a White House boat looks like it's just drifting. So we get closer on our fast response cutter to make contact with them. Nothing, no one responded used radio, loud hailer and ship's whistle. So captain said let's launch our small boat and go investigate. During the small boat mission brief, I reminded everyone that it's Halloween day and this looks just like a horror movie storyline. So the boat launches and the crew gets on board. The doors are closed, but lucky open so the crew can investigate. The boarding team slow conducts its safety sweep while looking any crew on board. So here is a houseboat floating on the ocean with no land in sight abandoned. So the boarding team marked the vessel with spray paint and left it. Houseboat is probably in Europe if it didn't succumb to the relentless sea. Another time in the middle of the night between midnight and 3 AM, we start tracking a target of interest. We clearly see someone and at least two others on a cabin cruiser. The vessel is unlit which is a red flag in steady speed. So we follow it and decide to launch the small boat for pursuit once they are close to US territorial seas. We run our small boat with lights off as well and have night vision goggles to help us see them. I pull up with 15 to 20 feet of the vessel and flip the blue lights and spotlight on them. No one is on the boat, all we see is a boat no one standing up behind the helm or on deck. So I creep up closer than all of a sudden, we see arm hanging over the gunnel. The boarding team starts yelling show us your hands and stand up. No one moved they were laying on top of each other. So we get the boarding team on board and start checking boat for safety. We transferred all of the 26 migrants off the 35 feet boat on the fast response cutter. The sunsets or sunrises are the best you will ever see. Some sailors will talk about the green flash once the sun sets. Never believed it, always thought it was a sea story until I saw it myself. There are lots and lots of birds that end up on the ship. No matter how hard you try to save them, they inevitably die. Watching the stars, though NVGs is amazing too. The creepiest incidents was when a friend and I were talking on the flight deck at night after our helicopter shut down. We were both looking into the port helo hangar, and I saw a shadow run out of a gear locker and into the wall. 
I thought to myself, that was weird, and wasn't going to mention it. However, my friend said, did you just see that shadow? I agreed, and we walked to the locker to see if anyone was there. No one was around. We tried to recreate it by walking where other people on the flight deck were and couldn't duplicate it. I was in transit to the outer edges of the Great Barrier Reef and the only one awake on the boat as it was my watch. The sun had already fallen below the horizon and as the light was fading, all of a sudden, the horizon caught fire. A glowing red vista appeared to extend thousands of feet in the air. As we regularly passed bulk gas carriers, I could only assume that one of these had exploded just over the horizon. For about 30 seconds, the entire skyline glowed like a fire, casting long shadows across the water. The bridge was bathed in an eerie reddish-orange glow that started fading as soon as it started. Not knowing what had just seen, I woke the captain to see if we should report what we saw. When I explained the situation, he merely scowled at me and said it was a rare phenomenon that he had seen May years ago around the same time of year. And that it was the light from the sun reflecting of the moon that had not yet risen. A truly mesmerizing experience. Absolutely worth the remaining seven days of the captain's wrath for waking him. I'm a sailor and dive master. One of the creepiest things I've seen was whilst sailing way offshore about five years ago. I noticed something weird in the water off the starboard bow, and get out the binos to check it out. It was a group of dolphins. About eight or ten of them, all in a circle, with their heads out of the water facing each other, bodies and tails completely vertical underneath them. Looked like they were having a goddamn business meeting out in the blue water, it was so bizarre. We were completely under sail and as such, very quiet. We came within about 10 meters of them, when they noticed us they disappeared. What the hell were they doing out there like that? Every time I meet a marine mammal expert marine biologist, I explain the story and ask, no answers yet. Can also agree with the sensation of being called into the void when alone on night watch. Sometimes I whisper into the wind and the wind whispers back, it's strange. Most amazing, well there are several amazing things I've been lucky enough to see. Most recently, I ended a dive and when I came up to the surface it was right next to a mother and calf humpback whale. The visibility was so bad we couldn't see them underwater at all, but the baby started breaching right in front of our faces, it was incredible. A few years back, went underway from Toulon on a high sea patrol ship for a routine patrol. The sea was very rough out of the roadstead, coming from the west, which was completely contradictory with what our weather briefs were indicating. Captain decided to go ahead nonetheless. We took a heading towards the east to enter Yer Bay, when we entered in the pass, things went down. I was outside, starboard wing of the bridge to take bearings when the ship took a 35 degrees list on starboard. If I had held my arm out, it would have been underwater. I held on the compass for dear life, because going overboard in that weather would have probably meant death. Needless to say, I shat myself. When the ship leveled, my boss went out to check if I was still there, and ordered me to go below to check how bad the damage was to some of our gear. I went, and when I was at the main deck, the ship took a 43 degrees list to starboard. I was then blessed with the horrific sight of a washing machine that was strapped in a room by the hull on port side punch a hole through a light bulkhead and go straight to starboard without touching the deck. Also, a lot of the firefighting equipment, axes, hoses, pumps, was just flying all over the place, with guys from the security department desperately trying to catch it and fasten it. At that point, we had entered the bay and had better weather. We had lost electricity in the bridge and CIC, so the captain decided to wait in the bay for the weather to calm down. When it did the next day, we pulled back into port for repairs. This little escapade resulted in a few bruises, the electrical network of the bridge and CIC being badly damaged. The guys that were supposed to strap thing down, didn't do it correctly and got punished. And for me, a reminder of my mortality. On a more positive note, I once saw a stork land on our 100mm turret after a sandstorm off Libya, and stay there for several hours. Also, we had a couple of sperm whales with a calf swimming alongside, for almost a day off Ivory Coast. When you see that kind of stuff, it doesn't matter if you are 3 months in or 20 years in, you feel like a kid again. Not working, but blue water cruising. We'd left Nassau heading for Spanish Wells on our 23 go fast after some shady characters tried to steal our boat while we were on it. I was nervous, afraid they'd come after us to get the boat. We'd gone a good ways when I started hearing a strange noise over the engine sounds, but there was nothing on the horizon behind us. 
I was sure it was them, what else could it be? I made sure the guns were within reach, even though my boyfriend wasn't worried at all. Somewhere off Rose Island, he shut off the engine and hopped over the side to clean the hull. I was really uncomfortable with this, but he was gonna do what he was gonna do. So he's over the side and under the boat when I hear the strange sound again. I'm looking all over, trying to figure out where the pirates are, when I see a disturbance in the water behind us. It's far away, but it's getting closer. I'm confused and alarmed. The wannabe pirates were scary, but the unknown is scarier. I lean over the gunnel and bang on the hull to get my boyfriend's attention. He surfaces and I'm screaming, get in the boat, get in the boat. He boards, and now we're both trying to figure out what's coming, and then it becomes clear that it's a small whale. Or a giant dolphin, I don't know, but I'm calling it a whale, so we waited as it beeline right for us. When it caught up, it rubbed against the starboard side of the boat with its back out of the water. It was about the same length as the boat and its back was covered in propeller scars. My boyfriend wanted to get in to swim with it, like an idiot, but fortunately reason prevailed. The whale investigated the boat thoroughly for about 15 minutes and then swam around us for a while before continuing to wherever whales go. We waited till it was out of sight before moving on to Spanish Wells, where we had a super weird night at the Yacht Haven, but that's another story. Japanese submarine slammed two torpedoes into her side, Chief. We was coming back from the island of Tinian into Leyte. We just delivered the bomb, the Hiroshima bomb. 1100 men went into the water. Vessel went down in 12 minutes, didn't see the first shark for about a half hour, Tiger, 13 footer. You know how you know that in the water Chief? You can tell by looking from the dorsal to the tail. What we didn't know, was that our bomb mission had been so secret, no distress signal had been sent. They didn't even list us overdue for a week. Very first light, chief, sharks come cruising, so we formed ourselves into tight groups. It was kinda like you see in the calendars, you know the infantry squares in the old calendars like the Battle of Waterloo and the idea was the shark come to the nearest man. That man he starts pounding and hollering, and sometimes that shark he go away, but sometimes he wouldn't go away. Sometimes that shark, he looks right into you, right into your eyes. You know the thing about a shark? He's got lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eyes. When he comes at you, he doesn't even seem to be living until he bites you, and those black eyes roll over white, and then, ah then you hear that terrible high-pitched screaming. The ocean turns red, and despite all the pounding and the hollering, they all come in and they rip you to pieces. You know by the end of that first dawn, lost a hundred men, I don't know how many sharks, maybe a thousand. I don't know how many men, they averaged six an hour. On Thursday morning, Chief, I bumped into a friend of mine, Herbie Robinson from Cleveland, baseball player, Boson's mate. I thought he was asleep, I reached over to wake him up. He bobbed up, down in the water, he was like a kinda top, upended. Well, he'd been bitten in half below the waist. At noon, the fifth day, a Mr. Lockheed Ventura swung in low and he saw us. He was a young pilot, lot younger than Mr. Hooper. Anyway, he saw us and he come in low and three hours later a big fat PBY comes down and start to pick us up. You know that was the time I was most frightened, waiting for my turn. I'll never put on a life jacket again. So, 1100 men went into the water. 316 men come out, the sharks took the rest, June the 29th 1945. Anyway, we delivered the bomb. 